Hi, good evening, everyone, uh, and welcome to Shivnada Fa Foundation Presents Conversations. My name is Sadaf, and I'll be your host this evening. You know, as the world faces unprecedented challenges amid the COVID-19 outbreak, the majority of us are dealing with something that we've never experienced in our lifetimes, which is limited or no mobility at all. That, combined with constant bombardment of information on the pandemic, can be unnerving for all of us. Therefore, the Shivnada Foundation has created Conversations as a platform to bring to you inspiring stories of leaders from across various fields. We've already hosted celebrated musicians, actors, uh, sports people, Nobel laureates, uh, diplomats on this platform. And if you haven't had a chance to See these conversations yet, I would urge you to do that as they will really inspire you and uplift your spirits in your time of isolation. These conversations continue to be available on our Facebook page. So do, uh, uh, whenever you get some time, do catch them. You know, let me take a moment to introduce our guest. Uh, over the next 30 odd minutes, you will have the opportunity to listen to and interact with celebrated author, historian, art historian and photographer. He has won every literary prize that there is to win and has been on every bestseller list that there is, and that too consistently for two decades now. Uh, his books, you know, tell us stories about the trials, tribulations and tragedies of otherwise formidable rulers that history books have failed to document. I think that William does not write history for the geeks, but for everybody who wants to know why they are, who they are. Please welcome the celebrated uh, William Dalrymple. Hi, Hi. William. How Hi, are you? Anna. Very good to be here. Welcome, and it's a pleasure to have you with us. Uh, thank you for joining the Shivnada Foundation Conversations, and everybody's really excited to have you with, have you great, here. Great pleasure to be here. So this I is just, the nearest thing one has to a social life at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but thankfully one does have this. Yes. <laughs> so uh, just some housekeeping rule for our listeners. You know, before we jump into this conversation, if you have any questions, please put them put them on the comments section below this video, and we'll try to take them up to the course of the conversation. So William, like we were uh, chatting just before we started this, I want to delve a little bit on your Twitter bio. It mentions you as a goat herd, Kabutar Baz, and Bad Farush. What does that really mean? So uh, I live on a farm in Meroli, uh, and I keep goats. I have okay. uh, I have about 20 goats, wow. so I'm a buckawal. Uh, I also have about 20 pigeons in a lovely kabuta kana. Okay. Uh, and uh, that's the kabuta bath. But Farouche uh, is a reference to how I earn my living. Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, Bad Farouche means a seller of wind. <laughs> okay. In first. <laughs> okay. Quite interesting. And I'm sure, uh, and I must say, like a brilliant choice of words, you know, that gets somebody really intrigued immediately. Um, so, uh, you know, before we, uh, I want to get to talking about Anarchy, of course, your latest book, but before we do that, I want to talk, I want to, I have this one question for you, which is about your writing in general. You know, your books always tell historical stories that have contemporary parallels, uh, and that's been consistent across all your books. Uh, why do you look at drawing these parallels? Why is it so important for you to do that? I think it makes history more interesting if it has a contemporary resonance. I wrote White Moogles after 9-11 when everyone was talking about East and West being in conflict. Uh, and it's a story of a love affair between East and West. Um, I wrote uh, Return of the King at a time when Western forces were in Afghanistan, uh, reminding them that Western forces have been in Afghanistan before and it, and it didn't end well. <laughs> <laughs> and now uh, the story of anarchy is a story at a time when there's all these anxieties about the power of corporations and uh, uh, and the way that Google and Facebook are harvesting our information. So uh, I, I just think it makes history uh, more exciting if you can see it affecting you today, if it's not something dead in the museum but something's right. alive and, and matters to you now. 
Right. Um, and you did start talking about anarchy. So I'm going to take that up uh, now. Uh, I mean, it is, it released only last year. It is one of the most critically acclaimed uh, works of nonfiction. Uh, it, in fact, Ma found a mention even in the former US President Barack Obama's favorite reads of the year. So, um, you know, it, talk to us about the East India Company and what got you intrigued uh, about the subject? What got you excited? What made you pick it up? Yeah. Well, I've been writing about the East India Company for 20 years now. Um, I've written four big history books, White Moogles, which came out in, I think, 2002. Uh, then Last Google, which came out in 2006. Uh, then Return of the King, which was 2012, maybe. And now the Anarchy. And all four examine this period of history, which has been slightly forgotten. The period between the end of the Great Moogles, after the death of Aurangzeb, and before the Raj begins in 1858. And all four books explore different facets of that period. But what interested me about the anarchy was the, was the fact that people still talk about Britain conquering India. And of course, it wasn't Britain. It was something much worse. It wasn't a nation state. It was a corporation based in one small office in London. Uh, it's like saying, you know, that uh, muddling up America and Facebook. They're obviously two different things. Facebook is a corporation. Uh, founded by Mark Zuckerberg and run out of an office in California. It's not the same as the American state. Uh, and the same is true of the East India Company. We've forgotten that the East India Company was a corporation. It was run by shareholders, governed by directors, and, uh, and ultimately run entirely for profit. Uh, and, of course, it's much worse than being controlled by a nation state. There is no reason for it to exist other than to extract... Uh, and, and, and to produce profits for shareholders. Uh, and I think the Victorians were responsible for this. They were embarrassed by the corporate and by the um, commercial origins of their empire. And they tried to build it into a story of national glory. And then the, the nationalist historians sort of took that on and turned it into a story of national liberation. And the fact that it was run by a corporation for profit has been lost. So that's what the book try and restores to the center of the story. Right. And, uh, you know, another thing I found really interesting in the book is, you know, it captures uh, an important part uh, in the history, uh, which probably has been missed in the popular understanding of how Indian history has evolved, which is, you know, the role of the Marwaris, the Jagat Seth, played in the country's conquest. And do you want to touch upon that a little bit? <laughs> Sure. Uh, that was something I, I, was, I wasn't sure how that would go down. Uh, in a sense, you know, you're on quite safe ground when you're doing the Tashi Thoreau stuff, talking about how Britain extracts uh, a loot from a conquered country. You know, Indians love to read about that, and uh, the British are quite used to reading about that. But when you start talking about collaboration, it's obviously a much more tricky and sensitive issue. But the reality is that the company ultimately won over its rivals because it had better resources than its rivals. Partly those resources came from the fact that it had controlled Bengal, which was then the richest part of India. Today, you know, obviously, it's Gujarat or Maharashtra or the Punjab. Um, and we don't think of Bengal as being a particularly rich part of India. But in the, in the 18th century, it had one million weavers. It was it controlled India's export trade, which was largely textile-based. India made the greatest textiles in the world. Uh, they were incredibly cheap, incredibly uh, finely made. No one could produce uh, textiles of similar quality at similar price, which is why the company came to, to Bengal. Uh, why Calcutta was founded. And, what, and once they got that, the, te the revenues which originally had funded the Mughal state, the, you know, Bengal had been the main source of revenue for the Mughals, that revenue went to the company. But in the end, it, it got support of India's banking sector. 
Uh, the Mawari is, you know, still obviously very important in banking today, uh, were absolutely critical to mogul banking. Uh, and the Jagat Sense had invented a very clever Hundi system for transferring the revenues of Bengal to Delhi. Uh, and when the, the company turned up in the early 18th century, the Jagat Sets backed the company. It was the Jagat Sex who actually paid the company to march north and, and get rid of Siraj Udaula. Right. And later it was Allahabad and Patna banking houses that, that backed the company. Why did they do it? Because the company might loot, it might extract, right. it might plunder, but it understood the importance of honoring commercial contracts. It repaid interest in full, on time. And therefore, if you were a banker, uh, this was a more reliable way, horse to back than, say, the Marathas or Tripu Sultan. Right. Uh, you know, uh, there is one thing that I also read recently, and I want to ask you that, and it's uh, right. it's about Anarchy. You know, I read recently that uh, you've sold the film rights to the movie. Um, <laughs> and I want to know, who do you want to play the main characters? Like, who do you want to play, Clive or Charlotte? So I'm not yet at liberty to reveal who I've sold the rights to. Right. But it's we're aiming to turn it not into a movie, but into a kind of big Netflix style series. Um, who would I like? Well, this weekend we saw uh, uh, Amitabh Bachchan break cover, say that he was reading and enjoying the book. Yes, he did. So he's clearly a candidate for the elderly Shah Alam. <laughs> That'll be um, interesting, yes. As for the young Shah Alam, I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's obviously uh, a number of candidates. I think Shah Rukh's too old, Rabi and now, so we have to get one of the younger guys. Uh, right. As for a good British villain for Clive, how about Rafe Pine, Lord Voldemort, to play uh, <laughs> uh, the, wicked, the wicked Robert Clive? Right, right. I'm sure everybody's going to wait for this with bated breaths. I'm sure it will come alive on the screen very soon. And I'm sure everybody's going to have a fun time watching this. But I want to take a moment here. And you know, there are lots of questions coming in from our listeners as well. So uh, what I'll do is I'll keep uh, asking you these questions in between. And you know, uh, so the first one is from uh, uh, Divyata Kota. Uh, and she wants to know, how does one really decide what to write? and when the genre is history. For history is widely debated and sometimes sensitive and controversial. You yourself touched upon it when you were talking about, you know, the Marwaris and the role they had to play. So how do you really decide what genre and how do you balance the sensitive topics? So I think you're in the position of insensitive, like being a judge at a trial when you're a historian. Um, often there are two or three conflicting accounts. Uh, of any one incident. For example, um, how the Battle of Buxo went. You've got two or three British accounts. You've got a couple of accounts from the other side. You've got individual Frenchmen. And you read all the different accounts and you, you make a decision as a historian which one you think is, you know, which is the likely course of events. And so what I tend to do is I, I read the accounts, I read the primary sources, I, I get as much information as I can about about any one event, where possible, visit the, the, the actual landscape, see where the battle took place or whatever it is. Um, and then you make a decision. And the minutiae of why you believe su such a character rather than another account, I put in the footnotes. So okay. there's 100 pages of footnotes after the main thing, explaining where I get the information from and right. why I believe such and such a witness. Um, and then there are, you know, there are some occasions when you have a, a modern vision of someone, uh, which is quite at odds with what people at the time are saying. For example, Siraj Dalla from the early 20th century was turned into a kind of nationalist hero. But at the time, his own cousin says he's a sort of bisexual rapist. The British, the French, the Dutch, the Mughals disagree on everyone, except the fact that Siraj Dalla is this monster. So you, <laughs> so you have no option in a sense, but to um, revise the temporary opinion and, and say what you say what people thought at the time. 
Right. And then again, you, you know, you put notes and you explain. So just like if you're trying to judge what happens in a contemporary incident, a, a, a traffic accident takes place. Um, there are 20 witnesses. Right. You believe people who were there who saw it themselves over people that heard what happened later. Of course. And that's the, that's the basic thing. You've got to, you know, find eyewitness accounts and, the, and then judge their credibility. It may well be that, you know, a subsequent historian has a different view that such and such an account is, is more reliable than, in their view than another one, and, which is why history continues to be rewritten by different witnesses. True. Absolutely. You know, I want to take a, uh, use this opportunity to move from Indian history to William's history, you know, and uh, you said that when you came to India, you fell in love with the country. And since you since then, you've also made Delhi your home, your second home, you spend a significant part of the year here. What about uh, India? Uh, what what is it in India that sort of got you hooked on? Why did you decide to put down your roots here in a way? So I spend nine months of every year here. Um, and normally I escape in June, July, and August to uh, cooler times in Scotland. Though I think this year I'm probably going to see the whole thing out. You will witness the Indian summer. <laughs> you will experience the Delhi heat for sure. I haven't actually seen the breaking of the monsoon for about 10 years. So uh, it will be a change for usual. Yeah. Uh, why? I I moved here age 19, immediately fell for it, and really been living here ever since. Uh, you know, we all make decisions about where we want to live, whether we want to live where we were born, where we went to college, where we moved, or, uh, and this is the place I've made my home. I've had different careers at different times. I started off as a travel writer. I became a foreign correspondent, a commentator, a critic, then became a historian. Um, I've more recently been a photographer, a, a festival director, and, and India has accommodated all these different uh, enthusiasms, and uh, I'm very grateful. <laughs> Long day. <laughs> <enough. laughs> and you know, uh, another point connected to that is about Delhi. And you know, you you said that when you first came to Delhi, and it was in 1984, if I'm not wrong you were com almost completely untraveled um, since then of course you uh, you you know you've written so much about indian history and you also you also write about travel your travels but do you think your experience in the city have really shaped you as a writer or the person that you are today yeah delhi is very important for me um, it's it's the place which is I've spent most of the last 30 years, and I've seen it grow from a small Sarkari Punjabi city to, to now you know, this great capital, which from space is 26 million people. Uh, right. if, you include, or if you include Noida and Gogaon and all the bits and around. Uh, and I, you know, for all the pollution, for all the things that people dislike about Delhi, the government, how much lovely people are, the Durbari ways. Uh, it's still my favorite city. Uh, it, it, in terms of work, it's in the next archives here for me, good libraries. There's a huge base of writers and people that are interested in the same Absolutely. stuff as me. What used to be a small government city is, is now a world city. It's the one city in India where you can find people from Tamil Nadu. Gujarat, Bengal, the north, the northeast. Right. Everyone's here. And publishing industry, uh, journalism is here. Um, and it's, you know, there's book launches in season every night. There's right. good museum, good restaurant. Everything I really want. And, and I've got lovely farm. <laughs> my goats, my pigeons. So yeah, I'm, I'm very happy. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, you know, you did mention that you're a co-director of the festival and that's the Jaipur Lit Fest. Uh, but I wanted to talk to you about, uh, you know, this new series that has been started called The Brave New World. Uh, can you just talk to us about that? And, you know, it's, sure. it's, it's started in the right time, really, because everybody's sitting at home. It's a good time for people to catch up. And so, what is the author lineup like? Yeah. <laughs> so I strongly recommend that anyone watch 
watching this to tune in. We're on every Wednesday, Saturday, and Sunday night. We have two sessions in the evening, uh, one normally about 5.30 and one at night. Uh, you go in through the JLF Instagram, Twitter, or uh, Facebook accounts. And what we found was that basically, I mean, we always get, you know, premier writers at the Jai Bullet Fest. People will come. It's widely regarded as the best day fest in the world. And people do enjoy themselves there. So they, come, they we, have, we throw good parties. And the, the words got around. So, so most people say yes. But now everyone who's ever said no has said yes too. <laughs> so <laughs> people like Edmund de Waal, Alain de wow. Breton, um, who've never been Robert McFarlane is on tomorrow with me. He's 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 finally said yes. Margaret Atwood and Jhumpa Lahiri, who've both been, wow. but uh, difficult to pin down. They've both sure. turned up. We've got Ohan Pamuk. I mean, really the greatest writers of international stars in the world. They're all they've all said yes. So we're very. Oh, that's happy. really great. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Uh, I want it, it, uh, you know, we have an interesting question from one of our listeners, and it's basically, and I also had a question on this, so let me just take that up right sure. now. It says, most of your books have been time zone in the 19th century. Do you want, do you intend to write something on the ancient and the medieval history as well? And if yes, then do you have some ideas in your mind? So, yeah, absolutely right. My, my period has been sort of you know, the death of Aurangzeb, 1707 to 1857, 150 years between the Mughals and the Raj. And all my books have been set in them. And I'm now engaged in something completely different, which has long been a, an interest, but I've never quite dared to sort of venture into this territory, which, I mean, as yet, I know less well. So it, it's the story of how Indian civilization and learning diffused out of the country via first Pakistan and Afghanistan. I mean, not what the modern the modern countries. Uh, Buddhism moving north at, until it becomes in the seventh century the state religion of China. Then eastwards, how Hinduism travelled to take over. Burma, Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, Vietnam, Indonesia, uh, culminating in Angkor Wat. And then the third part is going to be how Indian astronomy and mathematics moved westwards, first to Baghdad, uh, where it uh, became the base for Arab numerals, Arab mathematics, and finally via Fibonacci to Florence. And, and Renaissance of Europe. So that today, when we talk about um, Arabic numbers, what we're actually talking about is, is, you know, Indian symbols that first appeared at the time of Ashoka and Brahmi. Right. Uh, and when we talk about algorithms, we're talking about uh, the system translated from Sanskrit by al uh, And uh, algorithm is just a, a, a mangling of Al Khwarizmi, the man who translated, um, uh, ab, you know, the early Hindu astronomers, and mathematics, Aryabhatta, and, uh, and right. so on. Right, but that's a huge, huge historical landscape you're talking about. And yep. <laughs> how does really one go about researching? And what is the kind of time frame that you really look at when you're working on such vast piece? Well, actually, it's quite a tight little frame. The the story of Buddhist takeover of China is really the third to the seventh. Century. The story of the rise of the kind of Sanskrit cosmopolis and the rise of the Hindu kingdoms in Southeast Asia is again sort of fifth to ninth century. And mathematics arrives in Abbasid Baghdad in the seventh century. And, and, and a little bit later, it reaches Europe. Um, but it's actually not a huge time frame. It's the, the, the main focus is sort of 300 years between sort of 500 and 800. Uh, okay. And oh. we've got lockdown, so I've got nothing else to do. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. I'm sitting at home. Right? <laughs> I've disappeared completely down this rabbit burrow. My family might have seen me. I'm uh, okay. reading this morning about uh, 
uh, ancient Indian mathematics and so on. Okay, so you're you're set for the lockdown. Basically, you've got your work completely carved out for the next five years. <laughs> okay, oh, that's a long time. Okay, yeah. I, I want to talk about a bit about your travel writing. You know, you started with travel writing. You started with writing travel books, and then you moved into history. How is one really different from the other, or they really similar in that sense? Well, I mean, obviously they're very different. I mean, I've done different kinds of writing at different times. I've been a journalist, I've been a foreign correspondent, uh, I've right. been a literary critic, um, and travel writing is different from history. That said, my travel writing was very historical, and my history writing is very visual, I suppose, <laughs> and fairly global. So uh, they do they do impinge on each other. But I'm lucky enough, you know, I I'm able to do what I like, really. Right. Some some authors move between fiction and non-fiction. I've stuck to non-fiction, but right. I'm stuck to this part of the world. But uh, uh, I'm free to write about what it is. So okay. far, my readership has come with me. Let's see whether they come on this next adventure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And what about um, William, the photographer? You know, uh, so you have this wonderful Instagram handle that keeps giving us a peek inside. Uh, what you do as, as part of photography, you've captured some amazing unexplored pieces of Indian history. Tell us about your interest in photography. So that was an old interest. When I was at school, these were still the days of film cameras and uh, dark rooms. And as a teenager, I used to, I had a grandmother who died and left me some money and I spent it on a really good SLR camera. <laughs> So a lot of my teenage times and my friends were kind of out cruising girls somewhere. I was in the dark room smelling of chemicals uh, with sort of fixer stains down my shirts and smelling of developer and, but would emerge with this lovely sheaf of uh, black and white A4 paint. And when I discovered the Snapseed, I found I could make those sort of black and white images again, but on a phone without covering myself in chemicals and smelling of dark room. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, I, the Vadera Gallery in Defence Colony shows my work. I've had nice shows in Bombay and London. And it's very like it's, it's, a, it's a kind of hobby on the side. Okay, great. Um, you, I want to take a question from uh, one of our listeners here. And, you know, it's, it's a very pertinent question. You know, uh, he says that Indians are obsessed with history, but lack the foundation of historical facts. How do you see that changing with the new generation loving memes and avoiding books altogether? Well, I think Indians do love history, but I think it's very badly taught in this country. And almost every email I get from a reader begins, I hate history at school, but. Um, and in a sense, I should be grateful in that, you know, I, I've been able to make a career out of presenting history in an accessible manner. Because when I, when I started, very few people were doing it. There's now, you know, amazing new generation coming up, people like Aram Upoti, who did a wonderful book on Akbar that came out this week, Manu Pillai. And so on, you know, Poverty Sharma, there's, there's a great many of them out there doing wonderful narrative, accessible history that people want to read. Uh, but certainly when I started off 20 years ago, there was much less of that. Uh, there was actually kind of Ram Gulbar and that was kind of it. Right. Um, so I had period to myself for a bit. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, you know, connected to that, William, you know, there's another question, which is, uh, you know, that while your writing is something that many of and i think this is a teacher so she says uh, when he or maybe he says uh, my students are hooked on what would you say to teachers who are trying to engage children through their own writing and uh, what is your in your writing uh, oh sorry no what in our writing might our students find engaging how do i pick context that they can relate to goodness um i mean i think the key is to let the history speak for itself. There's, you know, incredible primary sources in the 18th and Mughal periods, and uh, and I go looking for primary sources, translate them out of Persian and over to and, and present them. In a sense, the miracle is that history has been made so boring for so long. 
because it's, it's it's fabulous stuff right um another interesting one and this probably needs you to look into the crystal ball a little bit and i know historians don't like doing that but you know uh, this is cherry hit curry and she says mr Dalimpul, how do you think indian history would have evolved if the mughals had remained strong enough to resist colonialism so i mean you have to only have to look as far as thailand for a monarchy that did remain strong enough um to resist colonialism. Thailand was never colonized and it's fine. Uh, I don't think Indian history would have been so very different. The British like to pretend that they transformed the country and did all sorts of miraculous stuff that wouldn't have happened otherwise. But Thailand shows that countries that haven't been colonized developed in very similar way. Okay. Mm. Or Turkey, you know, in Turkey yeah. is another example somewhere. There was a Levant company but because the Ottoman Empire remained united, uh, the Levant Company never took over the Ottoman Empire in the way that the East India Company took over the Mughal Empire. Uh, and, you know, there were 20th century conflicts as the Ottoman Empire imploded at the end of the First World War. But uh, Turkey emerged out of that nation state. What you get, I think, in, in many parts of the world in the 19th century, places that were very much cultural where different religions live side by side gave way in, in the old Ottoman lands to a series of nation states. So you had you know, the Bulgarians, the Armenians, the Jews went to Israel, the, the Syrians stayed in Syria. And, and you find this polarization by, by religion and by language. Uh, it is possible that India would have you know, disintegrated by the language groups. When the Chinese children who sang arrived in Jalalabad in the seventh century. He said, I've now arrived in in, in Bharat Russia and now arrived in India. It is a it is a land of 70 countries. Uh, and he regarded, you know, there were 70 political units. He realized he'd come to a place there was a single cultural entity uh, and a single geographical unit, but it's politically with 70 different countries. It's possible that India would have been, you know, a much more politically divided place than it is now. There was no inevitability about the massive nation state that we have. Right. Um, uh, another question from one of our listeners is, uh, this is Anand V. Raman, and he says, your tips to budding historians, especially leveraging technology to their advantage. Well, with or without technology, the basic grind of this story is the same. You, you, you find primary sources, you translate them, you read them through, you take notes. Uh, whether you take notes on a laptop or in a um, card index in the old fashion, it's, it's still the same craft. It's not like sort of particle physics where uh, new technology transforms, <laughs> you know, how you do it. <laughs> Right. Um, and I had a question uh, related to that, which is really about the art of storytelling. So while you're, t you're really writing history, it is uh, also written in a format that is engaging, uh, that really, uh, you know, grabs the interest of the reader. So for everybody who's wanting to be a travel writer or, uh, you know, a blogger, can you just uh, share what is your secret for telling an arresting, mesmerizing story? Well, to learn how to tell a story, you should learn first to read. Uh, you know, I found how to write travel books by reading a lot of travel books and seeing what I liked, what, what, which authors I liked. And my early efforts, like in Xanadu, were very derivative. I mean, they read a bit like Robert Byron or Peter Fleming or the kind of authors I was reading. Uh, same way when, with my first history book, uh, Last Mughal, well, second history book, Last Mughal is very like my favorite historians. Uh, well, Sir Stephen Runciman wrote a book called The Fall of Constantinople, 4053, which is the story of the end of the Byzantine Empire. And I made that the model for The Last Mughal. So I think anyone who becomes a writer, I mean, you can't get a writer's course, you can do online this and so on. But ultimately, writers learn how to write by reading, by finding what they like and trying to write like their hero. 
Um, and that's the same with Mozart. You know, if you think of Beethoven, he starts off sounding like Mozart and gradually begins to sound like Beethoven. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Um, you know, Aditi Gaur, one of our uh, other listeners, uh, she also has an interesting question. And, you know, this is something that is discussed time and mean, again about history being subjective, about, you know, the person who's telling this history and the times the person's telling the history during the time, uh, you know, the times that the person is in when telling the history. So she says, how do you try to stop your personal views reflecting uh, in your writing and keeping it impartial, not boring? interesting but impartial well you try and be fair um you don't try and remove yourself completely you, you know it's the story is it's in a sense telling the story it will reflect his prejudices his enthusiasms uh you know if, if he likes one particular character and doesn't like another that will show um I think it's about being fair and being truthful. You, you you present history as the primary source is showing, uh, and you show that you're being fair, and 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 and, and, and you gain credibility by being credible, by being Absolutely. fair and, and balanced. Absolutely. Um, if you if you're, you know, blowing a trumpet loudly for one side. People spot that. If, if I'd been sort of massively supporting these Tinder company, I don't think I'd have had many readers in the country. <laughs> <laughs> if I'd been, if I'd been sort of totally negative about the British, I don't think I'd have had any readers there. But I think if you, you know, are aware that people are reading it from both sides, you try yeah. and present the story faithfully, uh, and and try and work out exactly what happened. And, and, and people will respond to that. They'll they'll see that you're being as truthful as you can, and being as balanced as you can. Right. Uh, you know, uh, uh, let me take this moment to ask you to shed some light on this uh, really famous anecdote. And, you know, tell us if it's true or not, which is about these, um, and it connects to the time uh, from, you know, the book Anarchy, uh, which is, uh, in fact, Shashi Tharoor also spoke about it. He said, you know, the, uh, the British really cut off the Bengali weaver's thumbs because they wanted to import, uh, you know, um, cotton from Manchester. And, you know, so basically to sort of put an end to the Bengali weavers uh, producing this high quality cloth that they were, they really chopped off their thumbs. Is that really true? It's not. Okay. Uh, <laughs> And um, I, I'm a huge fan of Shashing, and uh, I, I like him personally very much, and I like his book, but he's wrong about that. Um, okay. And I spent quite a lot of time working out what the true story was. So, well, first of all, during the East India Company, uh, there was no Manchester Cotton. Uh, Manchester got going in the kind of early 1800s, and Manchester Cotton was a thing in the 1850s. So there's no way that the British weren't importing anything to India uh, at this period, least of all industrial cotton. Uh, the point of the company was to, was to export Indian textiles. That's why they were there. India, particularly, specifically Bengal, made the best cotton, the best textiles in the world. And the Bengal, Bengali weavers were the source of the East India Company's fortunes. So what the story actually is, or certainly what the story is recorded, is that after the Battle of Plassey, when the company had got control of large areas of Bengal, in order to try and increase production, uh, according to a single source, and there is only one source of this, um, the character called William Boltz, who's actually Dutch, who was working in the English East India Company and was an enemy of Clive, he says that the company corralled weavers into kind of weaving camp, um, like sort of weaving concentration camp, and, and more or less shackled them to their wounds to increase production. And that some weavers were so desperate, they cut their own thumbs off okay. in order to get out. So William Bolt is the only source for the story. There's no other reference to this anywhere. 
not in Bengali, so it's got a mobile source, so it's got a friend, just William Burns. And so it's not a very credible story anyway. He wrote this book in order to discredit Clive, had him thrown out of, of uh, India. Bolts had a very bad reputation as a, as a planter and looter himself. Uh, and this book was deliberately written to, to bring Clive down. So okay. I suspect it's, it's, it, it's uh, an incorrect spin on a, 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 a tall story. Um, okay. But the, I mean, what's interesting is, 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 is how the story grew. And by the 19th century, it had become the British cut the thumbs off in order to stop local producers making cotton. Right. Uh, and so they could import their own, every one detail of which is wrong for the 18th century. Right. Um, let me take a question here from one of our listeners. And this is Monila Sapre. And she says, uh, William, I'd love to know which part of Indian history have you found to be the most intriguing and which of your books you find personally moving or resonating? So obviously, the period I've chosen to live in 20 years, which is this 150 years between the death of Lorraine Seb and the, and the great uprising of Ingrid Seven. That's the period I love. But I have to say I'm completely obsessed now with this early period, with the 7th, 8th century. I saw uh, there was a comment earlier in this thing that someone pointed out that it's exactly the same period that I wrote about in From the Holy Mountain, but that was writing about the Middle East, the Byzantine Empire. And it's true. That spirit I studied at college, and it's the period I wrote about before, but in a different part of the world. So I go back to my college roots, I suppose, but uh, uh, now it's about India. Right. Um, another question, I know you briefly touched upon this earlier, but I want to ask this as well. Uh, you know, do you plan to write, and this is uh, some Sambandan V.S. and he says, uh, do you plan to write one on colonial history viewed from a southern India lens? After all, Fort St. George was headquarter was a large presidency and the role played by the Madras presidency remains largely unknown. Well, there's a lot about southern India and the anarchy. Uh, the first section at the anarchy is all about the Carnatic Wars and uh, Fort St. George and all that stuff. And earlier, I've written a book white vocals, which is set in Hyderabad. It's the story of this true love affair that took place between about 1798 and 1805, between Karanisa Begum, the niece of the Hyderabadi Prime Minister Mir Alam, and James Achilles Kirkpatrick of the East India Company, who was the British resident in Hyderabad. And the story was that he got her pregnant converted to Islam, became a double agent working against the company for the Hydra, for the Hyderabadis. So that is a sudden story for you. Okay. Um, let me ask about your own influences, your inspirations, your favorite writers. If I, if you could just tell us who <coughs> are your three favorite, uh, you know, writers, one from the past, a contemporary, and maybe one who has, who do you, who you think has a very promising future? Well, if we're talking contemporary novelist out of India, I choose Cormac McCarthy, uh, The Road, Blood Meridian, um, All the Pretty Horses. I love those books, beautiful prose style. In non-fiction, I'd probably choose Robert McFarlane, who I'm speaking to tomorrow in Brave New World, um, who's a fantastic English travel writer, a nature writer, and one of the great prose stylists of our time. And for Indian writers, non-fiction, probably Sir Ketu Mehta, Maximum City I okay. love. Um, Indian fiction, I mean, all the obvious ones, all your amazing novelists, I love Arundhati Roy, Amitav Ghosh. Um, I, I think the Pakistanis give you a good run for the money too. Mohsin Hamid, uh, yeah. Daniel Moynardine, Kamala Shamsi. Uh, all three of those are spectacular writers. Mohsin Hanif, sorry, Mohamed Hanif. Mohamed Hanif, yes. Yeah. Okay. All those. It, so what's your reading list for the lockdown period? What are you reading? What do you plan to read? So I'm reading nothing except <laughs> Buddhism, early Gupta mathematics, <laughs> astronomy, 
uh, and uh, the whole story of, of Southeast Asia and Angkor Wat, all that story. So uh, I have a pile. I mean, I move this to show you my pile of books in the behind me. Yeah, is, wow. Okay. <laughs> like we said, you're set for five years. It's uh, it's a busy reading list. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Um, I love it. I've got no complaints at all. William, it's been a pleasure talking to you and thank you thank so you much so for thank joining you. us. It's been great. I just want to tell everybody that if you've not had a chance to log into this conversation, this is going to be available on our Facebook page so you can come back to this anytime. Um, William, once again, thank you Apologies, so much. Apologies, by the way, for the echoey nature of this. I hope it hasn't been as echoey for you as it has for me. But. <laughs> I could hear you loud and clear. Absolutely. And I think everybody else did as well. So thank you so much, William. It was lovely talking to thank you. Thank you, Zanaf. Thank you, Shibnada. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.